Now, during these 109 years, one staple on the program has always been the Oregon Dairy Story. And this year we are doing twice as well because we have two dairy stories, Ochoa Quesaria and Smith's Brothers Farms. Well, we are going to start with Ochoa Quesaria and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce my dear friend, Francisco Ochoa. And uh, let me just provide a brief introduction. Francisco is the owner and cheesemaker at Don Froilein Creamery in Salem. He has been making cheese since year 2000, and he specializes in handcrafted authentic Mexican cheeses, such as queso, queso fresco, queso Oaxaca, tortilla, and he, uh, Francisco will say it much better than I do, but he has won over 15 awards from the American Cheese Society competition, including most recently a first place award for his hand-stretched string cheese. And in fact, Francisco is perhaps the most celebrated and awarded cheesemaker in Oregon at this point in time. So we are very delighted to have Francisco join us. The topic of his presentation is Ochoa Quesaria and the Artisan's Path to Growth. Take it away, Francisco. Hello, everybody. My name is Francisco Ochoa. I wear many hats here at Ochoa's Quesaria. Sometimes you'll find me loading up cheese to, to go deliver it. Other times you I'm the maintenance guy. On the weekends you'll find me here making quesadillas on our quesadilla uh, bar. But today you find me here nervously, very nervously speaking in front of all you guys. I'm not very good public speaker, but I thank you all and thank you ODI for inviting me to share my story. I'm really honored to be here. The hat that I most enjoy wearing is the hat of the cheesemaker. I love smelling the fresh pasteurized milk going into the cheese bats in the morning. And I also like to experiment with, um, with the curds, adding new spices, you name it. I really have a passion for R&D in my company. Our Chuas Quesaria, we specialize in authentic, traditional Mexican cheese under our brand name, Don Proilan, which gets distributed throughout the Northwest. I'd like to share my story with, with you on how we got started in the early 1990s. My family, my family and I immigrated from Guadalajara, Mexico. As I grew up, my father was always an entrepreneur and included the whole family in there. That's why I started very young with my adventure. Upon moving to Oregon, my parents very quickly discovered that they couldn't find any queso fresco on the Mexican markets. Actually, they could not find any Mexican products back then in a regular, Mex in, in a regular market. Growing up, queso fresco was a mass in our house. It goes with almost every meal. Simply just add queso fresco on a, on a fresh tortilla, and it was a real treat and it still is now for many families. My parents started out making a few pounds of queso here and there just for our family. And they, they started sharing with their friends and the neighbors and the neighbor's friends and just continued to grow from there. As it became more of the full time for my mom and dad, my dad left his restaurant job to, to keep up with the demand. My dad always dreamed of owning a full-scale creamery, but being an immigrant and with a little bit of English, there were so many hurdles, he couldn't just get over it. Unfortunately, in 2000, my dad passed away, but soon after his dream of opening a creamery was realized by my family and I. Using everything my dad left us and the help of an angel investor, we were producing queso fresco in a beautiful 1,500 square feet facility in Eugene. I had just graduated from high school by then. By then, my dad already showed me the right work ethic and the most important thing, sell cheese door to door in different neighborhoods. Like any other startup business with a big overhead and cash flow issues, it was really tough in the beginning. And not all of the family was able to to continue in the business 
as they as they they had to give pay on a regular basis to support their families. But not me, I keep on trying. And a few years later, I, I continued to learn more about the business and the cheese making. I was lucky to find a good source of milk, a lucky dairy. Not only the milk was good, but the support I got from the Gibson family was amazing. And it still is now. I also was introduced for a, to a free business advisor from the local college, which they helped me a lot through, through the process. Another very important person that I met early on is Elizabeth Garrick at OSU. She, was, she has been a big support of me and many other artisanal creameries in the state of Oregon. Anytime I reach out for help, for help she, she, she always answers and she knows a lot about cheese. She's the right person for cheese. In the 2008, I decided to move the company to Albany into a bigger facility. And now we were able to produce different, more different types of cheese, including queso fresco, Oaxaca, Cotija, Botanero, and even cheese curds. We had a, a small front store where we were able to talk to people about our cheese and make sure that they could understand what the cheese was about. As we produce more styles of Mexican cheese, our company kept, kept on growing and growing. Eventually, soon we grew our, our Albany location. In 2019, I had the crazy idea of, of building a new cheese plant with a building area. I didn't know how much work or money it would take, but my crazy idea wouldn't go away. So, now we are making 10,000 pounds of cheese on our, on our 9,000 square foot building in Salem, where you can come in to the New Dog of Poland Creamery and enjoy a quesadilla while you guys watch us making cheese. Or you can just come in for cheese samples or an ice cream. We currently employ 23 employees, including my mother, my three sisters, my wife, and my young daughter. I like that my family is still involved in the business. My daughter Liliana helps customers in the front of the store. She makes quesadillas. My three sisters help out, uh, help out in many aspects in the creamery, from quality control to accounting. I could not done it without them, but without them. And, and all, other, all the other friends, they helped me throughout these years. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Francisco. So uh, just a couple of follow-up questions, if, uh, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, you have grown. I remember initially you were making cheese in a small square pasteurizer, which was an adventure in itself. And because it was so small, you had to pasteurize twice. And for all of you in the audience who know what pasteurization is like, you heat it up, you wait, you cool down the milk, it takes hours and hours. And Francisco had to do it twice a day just to produce enough cheese. But now you have a big HTST system and everything is more efficient. But what were the biggest challenges when you experienced such growth? Well, like you said, we had a, we had a really small um, bad pasteurizer. So making several batches a day, it became a lot of work working long hours. And um, we just needed more space, more room. And our creamery in, in Eugene was too small and then Albany became too small. And just getting through all the other um, bank requirements and all that stuff was really, really tough. But at the end of the, at the end we were able to, to give financing for, for the Salem location with the help of, of the Salem, city of Salem and, and many other people that helped with this project we were able to, to start up in here in Salem. So you started up in Salem with part of your creamery is a restaurant, isn't that true? And yeah, so I had the idea of showing, well, I want people to taste the cheese and if they like it, they can take more home. So making a quesadilla and, and showing them, I thought that making quesadillas would be a really small job, but it's not, it's a full restaurant now. It's, it's a different 
different story in the restaurant, but, but we are able to manage it. So we, you can come in, build your own quesadilla, and um, you can see us making cheese on the big window. And you got to start this up in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, yeah. Are you guys back in full action now, or how is it going? Yeah, I was really, um, really scared when people start calling and canceling orders from restaurants and and then the constructions had already started, but it wasn't too far. So I was like, I was hoping that the bank wouldn't um, back down because I, I heard a lot of stories when, when the pandemic began, a lot of um, banks were not loaning money anymore. But thankfully the project continued and, and we were able to open for two weeks and then we closed down for another three months and we just finally opened the doors on, Mar on March. So people can come in and, and visit. Yeah, I stopped by here earlier. I was so impressed by uh, what you've accomplished. That's amazing. Oh, thank you. I do want to mention that Mark Bates is reminding everyone that there's uh, some of your cheese in the baskets. And uh, he's thanking you, uh, Francisco, for contributing cheese here. Oh, no problem. Hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah. So um, your cheeses have won as many awards at the American Cheese Society as any of the other uh, Mexican style cheese companies and cheeses in the US, I think. What do you think is the secret to you uh, producing such wonderful cheese? Well, we have a really good source of milk. Um, we, we use very fresh milk to make our cheese. It's, it's, uh, it's whole milk from the farm. And that's why uh, being a small producer, able to do producing artisanal cheese the old fashioned way. Mostly it's handmade. So that, that makes it special as well. Okay. So we do have a quest another question for you here. Uh, did your father ever make cheese back in before in Mexico? Or where did he first learn the, the process? So the way they, they started making cheese at home is because my mom my mom's um, parents they they live in a ranch and they had cows just just for their families. They didn't have a big business, but they milk the cows to have milk and they make cheese with the extra milk. And that's how my mom knew how to make cheese. And my mom and dad together <laughs> were able to create a, a queso fresco at home. You know, it's a wonderful story, Francisco. Thank you. What what would you say are the biggest challenges? for a person who loves cheese and loves making cheese, who might want to get into artisan cheese making? Well, you have to find a, a facility. Sometimes that's a challenge for a lot of people. You, because no matter how big or small you are, you still have to go through, through the same process and have all the equipment, the right equipment, the floors, the ceilings, you know, you have to have a, a, a facility to make cheese. And that could cost a lot of money. That's some the equipment itself is a little bit expensive, but it's possible. Just making a little bit at a time and continuing to strike and just don't give up. Keep on selling cheese. That's the main. Um, that's that's what I recommend people to. Do, do you see a product right now where you think there would be a market in Oregon for a specific cheese that nobody's making? A product. Well, uh, just cheese, the Mexican cheese, you know, I, I also, we, we've been playing with uh, using our whey to make a, a drink of a joker. So all the excess whey, um, we want to turn it into drink of a joker with okay. the help of the food science in Portland and you guys. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Good idea, Francisco. Great idea. So um, any other advice you want to give to, because many people who work, uh, the dairy scientists who work out for big dairy companies, they all kind of have a dream of doing what you are doing, which is you know, starting your own company, but it takes a lot of courage and certainly also a lot of money. But what is your advice for those among us who have this secret dream of starting up our own, own dairy company? Well, 
we also have to put a lot of hours in the, in the business. Like I said, I wear many hats. Sometimes I used to make a cheese. Next morning we'll package it and go sell it myself so I can save more money and labor and stuff like that. Just put a lot of time in yourself, believe in your dream and try to make the best cheese you can or the best products you, you want to show the people. And bring it. Thank you, Francisco. And I want to recommend to you that you open the chat here after we're done talking because there's a lot of kind uh, words and, uh, and uh, comments from people who've tried your cheese and really like it. Oh, thank you, I will. Take a look at what the ODI community is telling you. All right, well, thank you. And then I wanna thank you for introducing your company and congratulations with such amazing growth. I think your company has grown more than any other dairy company in, uh, in, the, in here in Oregon. So congratulations with supervising this growth and being at the point where you are today and good luck in the new new facility. Thank you, Lisa. And thank, thank you. Thank you all. very much, Francisco. Thank you. And okay, at this point we get to move on to a secondary story. And for this one, the topic is the Smith Brothers farm and the successful integration of Alpen Rose and is presented with us by Dustin Highland. And let me just very briefly introduce Dusty. Dusty Highland has been the CEO of Smith Brothers Farm since 2014. As part of the fourth generation of the Smith family, Dusty grew up around Smith Brothers Farm, but did not begin working for the dairy until 2012. Prior to coming to the dairy, Dusty spent the previous 12 years as a management consultant in Seattle and Atlanta. He holds an MBA from Emory University and a bachelor's degree in finance from Boston College. Dusty also serves as president on the Washington State Dairy Council Board. So Dusty, thank you for sharing your story with, with us and for a Smith Brothers Farm here today with ODI. And thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, and I just wanna quickly, since I have the podium, echo a lot of the comments in the chat right now. Uh, we've been uh, uh, selling uh, Francisco's cheese on our uh, delivery trucks now for uh, a number of months, and so I've had the chance to to uh, take some home some samples and 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 try it out. And the queso fresco, the botanero, are awesome. And my son won't eat any other string cheese uh, other than his now. So uh, thank you, Francisco. It's it, your uh, your products are wonderful. Um, uh, and thanks everybody for for having me. I, uh, uh, I I have a little presentation that I'll walk through. Um, um, so let me share my screen real quick. Uh, Elizabeth, can you give me a thumbs up if it looks okay? All right. Um, when uh, when I was asked to present, I was I wasn't quite sure uh, uh, where where I should go with this. Um, uh, and, and the advice I got was, you know, a lot of people down in Oregon, you know, know a little bit about Smith Brothers Farms only from what they read about the uh, acquisition of Alpenrose. And so it might be good to share a little history of, uh, of our business. Um, so I thought I'd start with that um, and, and, and the presentation talking a little bit about our integration, uh, our purchase of Alpenrose and the integration of the two businesses. Uh, and a little bit of how COVID has impacted us uh, over this past year, because uh, that's been a, a theme of ours uh, for, for more than 12 months now. Um, so get prepared for some old photos. Uh, my apologies in advance. Um, uh, last year, we celebrated our, our 100th year, uh, uh, our century anniversary. Um, as Smith Brothers was founded my, by my great grandfather Ben Smith in uh, in 1920, um, he started the business with a single cow in West Seattle. Uh, and as he his, the popularity of him selling milk door to door grew, he you know grew his herd to a, a few dozen and was able to find some a dairy farm, a proper dairy farm down in the Kent Valley, which is about 10 miles south of of West Seattle and. Uh, 
what would any respectable farmer do uh, to get his cows uh, those 10 miles? He organized a cow drive down what is now uh, I-5. So um, uh, imagine cows just kind of uh, uh, herding down the, down the freeway. Uh, that's what it was like 100 years ago. Um, this was our farm. This is back in, I want to say, the, in, in, the, in the 30s or 40s. Um, we operated uh, on this property for a little over 90 years, from 1921 to 2013. And um, you know what we're known for up here and how our business was started was home delivery, uh, with my grand, great-grandfather, Ben, uh, delivering out of his first Model T. Uh, you'll notice the fleet of trucks uh, at the dairy here as, as his business grew, uh, so did his customer base. Um, and over time, you know, like any good entrepreneur, he delved into a number of different businesses. Um, you know, we had a local airport on our property for a while. Uh, we delivered heating oil to homes. Uh, and we even, uh, you know, in order to get uh, 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 tractors for his farm, we actually ended up becoming the John Deere heavy equipment dealer in Washington state for a number of years. Uh, but at the end of the day, our home delivery was all, always remained our bread and butter uh, and still is today. Um, so as time passed, those Ford Model Ts were upgraded to a fleet of Divcos. And many of you may remember the old Divcos that you had to stand up to drive. Um, but as, as refrigeration um, became more commonplace, many home delivery dairies started to go out of business and, and uh, supermarkets came around and the, the old school milkman was, was kind of a thing of the past, but stubbornly, uh, and I'm not sure if it was a necessarily a good decision at the time, we stuck through it. Um, and when environmental regulations tightened in King County, we ended up moving all of our cows over to Royal City. Um, and I think at our peak, we had around 3000 cows on our dairy farm. We ended up selling that farm in 2006. Uh, uh, after the new pr producer handler laws were put in place. And Kathleen was actually talking about it earlier today. Uh, it's now Royal Dairy. Uh, and, um, you know, all the good thing that the good things that Austin and the Allred family have been doing over there have proven that they were much better and more innovative dairy farmers than we ever were. Um, but what we had created over time was an affinity for our service. So those that grew up, on our milk, uh, like this uh, young woman, uh, would would uh, have families of their own and uh, and start getting home delivery from their families, and it was a perpetual nature. and And I believe that tightness to our service and and the uh, the closeness of what that milkman uh, was to families really sustained us over time. But we realized that, you know, in order to stay relevant, we need to continue to improve our service. Um, so our family, which is currently made up of about 14 family shareholders, made the tough decision of selling our property in Kent that we've been on for over 90 years uh, and upgrade, upgrade to a new facility and go all in on home delivery. You know, uh, what we realized was that small to mid-sized dairies like ours really need a niche to to, to stay in business and really to compete in the marketplace. Our size makes it challenging to compete on the commodity market with the scale of larger dairies uh, and well-known brands like Derrigold and Tillamook and, and Safeway and Kroger. Um, but with home delivery, that's kind of our niche and we're able to capture the entire value chain from the production of the milk to the final sale to the end consumer. Um, you know, if you think about another thing, Alpenrose comparatively had that their niche was Baskin and Robbins. They were uh, the franchisors uh, and also the uh, ice cream supplier to them. So that was kind of their uh, uh, lock on the market. Um, so in 2013, we built this new plant to better serve our customers. Um, our old plant was getting pretty old, as you guys have seen old dairy plants. And uh, so we decided to, to make the investment and upgrade and it basically uh, was a huge investment for our family at the time, but it has turned out great. Uh, and we're really glad we did it. We improved our fleet. You know, we got larger, more fuel efficient, better refrigerated trucks, uh, and uh, which we needed to expand our, our, our product selection uh, and deliver more than just the milk and eggs that a typical 
uh, home delivery dairy or milkman used to do. So now we focus on delivering weekly staple products like dairy, eggs, bread, juice, cheese, produce, um, and, and really focusing and partnering with great local brands to deliver what we like to call uh, Northwest Essentials. So this is just an example of the companies we work with and our product selections we have uh, uh, up here at Smith Brothers, which is over, I think, 350 to 400 products on our trucks. Um, you know, in order to, to, to really make that happen, we, did, we needed to make a lot of investment in technology. So leaving orders on notes in the porch box didn't really cut it anymore. And so as, as consumers were all going online, you know, we really need to up our game uh, in our e-commerce presence to make e-commerce e presence, excuse me, to make ordering as simple as possible. So that included, you know, going mobile um, and allowing our customers to update their delivery on our app until 2 p.m. the day before, no matter where they were. Um, and our technology advances were not just consumer uh, facing, you know, they're really operational behind the scenes as well. Um, our paper route books were replaced by tablets. Um, we got rid of our manual routing process and uh, replaced it with this route optimization software that enables us, enables us to deliver to as many customers as possible on a daily basis. So currently one of our, uh, uh, one of our routes on a typical day will deliver to 150 to 300 customers. Um, obviously, depending on the density of the area we're serving. Um, but at the end of the day, to continue our growth, you know, we and and be, and remain a sustainable business, we really thought we had to expand geographically. And the logical place for us was Portland. And um, we had long talk about going down there. It was a logical place to expand, but, but trying to enter the Portland market, which is a very provincial market, as many of you know, Portlanders and Oregonians love their local products. Um, and going in with a Seattle brand is, is, uh, kind of a, uh, can be perceived as a slap in the face and be a lot more difficult to, um, to do. Um, but when we, so when we heard about the opportunity to purchase uh, an iconic Portland brand like Alpenrose, uh, we really jumped at the chance. Um, and um, many of you have read or heard about some of the struggles we went through in the more than year long negotiations uh, in the purchase, uh, but ultimately completed that purchase in 2019. And I mean, I think, I really think it was a perfect match. Both of our companies have a century long history. We're both family owned, have really close ties to the communities. Uh, and it, it, to me, it really made sense. Um, uh, we really complement each other. You know, this is a breakdown of uh, our volume by, uh, uh, by channel. Uh, both of us have large distributor relationships, obviously to distribute to food service, schools, retail manufacturers, uh, but we also do our own distribution. Um, and with Smith Brothers, we really brought the residential home delivery side of the business to the table. And um, Alpen Rose really brought the retail side that we didn't really have up here uh, at Smith Brothers. So we're very complimentary and are learning a lot from each other. Um, you know, we're both fresh HTST pasteurized fluid milk. Uh, Alpenrose, you know, gave us the ability to add sour cream, cottage cheese, and ice cream. We were already selling their sour cheese, sour cream and cottage cheese. Uh, so it was a great fit. Um, but as you all know, a few months after the sale, just as we were kind of finalizing our plans on how we're gonna integrate the two companies and how we were going to optimize production at each plant, COVID hit and basically changed everything. Overnight, our, our customer acquisitions went from, uh, and this is on March 12th, went from a few dozen a day to a few hundred a day. And it was all we could do operationally to keep up. Um, and then at the same time, you know, the other shoe was dropping as well. Our wholesale business just cratered. And so, you know, we were fortunate. We were, we were one of the businesses that was uh, ended up on the right side of the pandemic. You know, half of our business was, uh, was struggling, but it was propped up by that home delivery piece. Um, and, and so uh, we were one of the lucky ones and I, I truly count my blessings for that. Um, 
and ultimately we were able to come out ahead. But as we were looking at, at, at what we were doing, we kind of said to ourselves, hey, you know, the coronavirus pandemic has really created the greatest marketing event for home grocery delivery that anyone has ever seen. If we're going to do a uh, home delivery in Portland, which we were planning to do, you know, sometime later in 2021, now's the time, let's try to take advantage of it. And fortunately we had all the system set up. We had the people in place um, and uh, we kind of had the playbook for lack of a better word uh, to start home delivery down in Portland. And so we were able to, in a couple months, uh, prop up home delivery and get it kicked off in August of last year. Um, we had a great reception at first. We got a lot of pictures like this where customers who were uh, Alpen Rose home delivery customers back in the day, I think they stopped uh, stopped that service back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, uh, we were surprised to see how many people signed up and said, hey, here's my old box and here's my, my new Alpen Rose box. So uh, it was it was nice to be able to kind of kickstart uh, this new business uh, for us, and we really you know kind of followed the playbook that we that we had uh, that we have up here in Seattle. Um, partner with great iconic local brands in Portland and around Oregon. Uh, you see Don Forlan on here, but you know obviously Tillamook, France, Dumptown Coffee. Um, uh, we're partnering with restaurants like Renata Pizza. Gravy and Blue Star to kind of deliver some of their foods and really, you know, partnering with them to help them out because they were really struggling during this pandemic. So it was really a nice uh, way to um, to to kick off this new business for us. Um, and so uh, that's basically the uh, the the quick version of the Smith Brothers story and, and how it came to be with Smith Brothers and Alpen Rose. Uh, and I just wanted to say a quick thank you uh, for having me. You know, I, I, I've been to a number of ODI conferences and golf tournaments and Future of Dairy in the Northwest and surprising the right word, I'm always just uh, delighted and love how supportive and collabor collaborative everyone is uh, in this industry. So uh, thank you for having me today and uh, look forward to uh, many years uh, in Oregon to come. Well, thank you, Dusty. That was a great presentation and certainly welcome to, to ODI as a dairy story. We uh, look forward to seeing you again when we uh, go out golfing this July and to see your products in um, come this fall for the ODI product evaluation as well. Absolutely. Um, before, yeah, let me just uh, read a question from, from Sherry. What other companies are doing what Smith Brothers is uh, in food delivery and how did you learn from their example? Um, you know, it's over the past year, a, a number of companies have come up. So when the pandemic started, if you think about it, what, what a lot of people have said is um, things that have been worked on for years and years. Amazon Fresh started up here in Seattle in 2007. So they've been going for a long time. Uh, Instacart has been around for a number of years. Uh, Safeway and Kroger, Fred Meyer have doing deliveries or click and collect for a while, but they never made it up to that really mainstream peak that they hit during the pandemic when all of a sudden everyone was like, wait a second, I can't go to the grocery store anymore, bring it to me. So a lot of our you know, changes in technology and innovations around that really have been you know, trying to look at what other people are doing and stealing from. So whether it's Amazon Fresh, you know, looking at Instacart, trying out all these different services. Uh, and then, you know, we invested time building all this ourselves uh, so that we, because it's pretty custom on what we do and our business model and how we deliver. So uh, it took us a while and it's a continual process and we continue to, to, to play with it and, and update our website and update our process and things like that. So um, now it's, it's, commonplace, right? Everybody, I, I'm, I'm assuming almost everyone on this call has uh, ordered their groceries delivered by someone during this pandemic uh, or ordered food from a restaurant delivered by Uber Eats or DoorDash or something. So it's uh, really become more commonplace, which, you know, you could say that's 
it's good for us. Everyone knows it's there now and, and we're part of that. Or you could say, man, that competition's gotten tough and watch out, you better be on your game. So uh, we look at it in both lights. Yeah, so I have another question here. Have you been approached by news organizations? This is such a great story of local food, business innovation and community building. Uh, yeah, we've done a few uh, small uh, stories and, and small articles with like the Oregonian, a couple TV stations. More, uh, over Easter, uh, you know, historically Alpenrose has had the Easter egg drop or the Easter egg roll at their at their property. And, you know, for a lot of different reasons, we're not having it this year, the pandemic uh, or in the last two years, the pandemic being the major one. And so Easter Steels had reached out to us because they normally sell their tulips at um, at the uh, uh, at the egg roll. And we said, you know, what if we sold them on our trucks and delivered them to our, to our customers? And so I forget exactly how much money we raised, but I think we sold like 6,000 uh, bouquets of tulips uh, uh, the week or two before Easter. And, you know, we're able to kind of try as best we could to continue on some of the traditions that the um, uh, Alpenrose families had started over time. Um, and that's kind of been the toughest thing for us because uh, as some of you know, the the PR at the beginning of our, our union was uh, a little bit difficult, but I think it's um, as time heals all wounds. Um, and, uh, and so it's, uh, uh, it's getting better and we're always looking for opportunities to, to do cool things and, and connect with the community. Yeah, interesting. I, I do have to ask a question. What happens post pandemic, post COVID? Yeah. So that's the thing that we've been worrying most about. And, and at the start of the pandemic, you know, we, you know, our mailman, our people in the warehouse were working you know, copious amounts of overtime. And so we're like, all right, we got to hire, we need more trucks. And we're like, are we making this investment for a three month, six month bump that's just going to fall back to where we are right now? And we basically said, I don't care, you know, we can, we'll figure it out and let's make the investment and, and, and do this. And, you know, a year in, things are still good. A lot, all the customer, I shouldn't say all, um, we haven't seen any elevated attrition in our customer base yet. So uh, people are saying now the pandemic's still going on to your point. So yeah, I'm, I'm worried about what happened after the pandemic, but I do think that, and what we've seen with our customers historically six months kind of creates a habit. And, and so we're a year into this now. And so my, my hope, and we're gonna to continue to work hard to make sure this happens, is that our, these customers who signed with us, up with us over the past year will stick around because now they're used to it and they, now they know what they were missing from before, right? Okay, thank you, Dusty. Unfortunately, we will not have time for all the questions. I apologize to those of you who, added more questions in the chat, but we do need to continue with the program. So tremendous and heartfelt thank you to Francisco and Dusty for these two wonderful stories that really demonstrate how interesting and diverse our dairy industry is here in the Pacific Northwest. And I look forward to seeing both of you next year at ODI in, in Salem. Absolutely. So with that, thank you. And we're moving on.